Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar for fiscal year 2020 titled Completing Quality SOAR Applications, specifically understanding SSA's listings and the grids. My name is Pam Hines, Senior Project Associate with the SOAR TA Center, and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items to review. A disclaimer. This training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA or DHHS. The training should not be considered substitutes for individualized care and treatment decisions. Just a few um, housekeeping reminders. Um, as a reminder, your lines will be muted throughout the entire webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on, the, on SAMHSA's YouTube channel shortly and by request. You may download the presentation slides now by going to the top left of your screen and clicking File, then Save, then Document, or visit the SOAR website at soarworks.prainc.com Click webinars on the left sidebar and choose today's topic. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be automatically redirected to a SurveyMonkey evaluation. And it, it looks a little bit different than last time, so we'll provide some um, more description at the very end. Um, so, and finally, we will save all questions and comments until the end of the presentations, at which time we will review instructions uh, for posing uh, questions to panelists via the Q&A box. So it is our intention that by the end of this webinar, you will learn how to access and utilize SSA's listings of impairments and better understand the grid rules. Also, understand why it's important to understand how SOAR applicants may be awarded at step three with the listings and step five of the sequential evaluation process where you'll find uh, the grids will be helpful for individuals with a combination of impairments. And also learn how to reference specific listings and the grids in your medical summary reports. So just to go over the agenda, today's pre uh, presenters, uh, back again is Jennifer Enkin um, with the DDS in Las Vegas. She's the DDS uh, Disability Adjudication uh, Supervisor, so we're really glad to have Jennifer back with us. Also, uh, Meg Retz, who is a stellar a staff attorney with the Homeless Advocacy Project, HAP, in Philadelphia, uh, which is one of our best practice or programs, too. Also, Denise Kesey from Portland, Oregon, who also represents an amazing SOAR program, which is called BEST. Uh, Denise is a local lead and a community liaison uh, with the BEST program at Central City Concern, who also has been a presenter in past webinars, so we're really glad to have Denise back as well. And then again, your Q&A will be facilitated by uh, SOAR TA Center staff as well at the end. So um, I'd like to introduce Asha Stanley uh, with SAMHSA, who will be doing today's welcome. Asha? Thank you, Pam. A warm welcome to all of you joining us today. On behalf of SAMHSA and the Division of State and Community Systems Development of the Center for Mental Health Services, I would like to welcome you to this SOAR webinar on the topic of completing quality SOAR-assisted applications titled Understanding the Listings and the Grids. As many of you know, SOAR helps states and communities increase access to Social Security disability benefits for eligible adults and now children and youth who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness and have a serious mental illness, medical impairment, or a co-occurring substance use disorder. Today's webinar will give you many practical and proven ideas to help you better understand SSA's listings of impairments and grid rules. I would like to welcome and thank our presenters for your willingness to share your expertise with us. I will turn it back over to Pam Hain, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you so much, Asha. I also want to, um, um, let's get things started. 
Um, I'm going to turn the mic over now uh, to Jennifer Enkin uh, with DDS, who's going to get things started with us. Jennifer? Thank you, Pam. Good afternoon. Um, again, I am Jennifer Ankton. I am a disability adjudication supervisor with the state of Nevada, and I do have um, extensive years of experience as a disability adjudicator as well. And basically what I'm going to do today is just provide um, a, a brief overview of the listings that are most common, commonly evaluated with um, DDS. Um, it's, there are 14 listings, and each listing could probably take a day to, to give you um, a full training experience. Um, so I'm going to do my best to just give you a brief overview and some important information on um, how to utilize the listings, uh, utilize the Blue Book, as we call it, um, which is essentially our Bible that is a reference tool on how we are evaluating the claims as they come in. Um, so the first, um, the first thing that we do basically is look at the sequential evaluation uh, process for adults, and um, or we call it the SSA sequential evaluation. So there are five steps to the um, to the adjudication process. That once the claim is received in DDS, we have these five steps. I am basically going to talk about step three, which is the um, meeting or equaling a list. And if we're able to get a claim approved at step three, that is great for us. Um, we can get the claim out the door and you know an answer to that claimant right away. But as the claim comes in, the first thing that we're looking at at step one is if you know we want to know if this person is working and if they're working, are they engaging in SGA? And currently that amount is $1,220 per month. So if their SGA amount is over that, then um, unfortunately we cannot make a decision of disability at that point. Um, if they're not, then we move on to step two. Does the person have a severe, severe impairment? And in order for us to do that, we have to have the medical evidence. So that's usually what we're looking at once we receive our first piece of medical evidence. If we receive a claim with medical evidence and we have the information in the file, we are able to make that decision determination right away if this person has a severe impairment. If they do, we go on to step three. Does the information that has, that has been provided, does that information show that this claimant currently meets or possibly equal a listing? Maybe not. If it doesn't, then we, you know, if it doesn't, then we at least have some direction on where we're going to go, what we may need to, um, allow this claimant at step three. And so essentially that could result in us like, you know, making a phone call to try to get things expedited. Um, if for instance, if we have a diagnosis of a listing level cancer condition, but we don't have the actual pathology report, then we will make a call to try to get that pathology report to support the severity of that, um, that cancer. Um, I won't go into step four and five, but that's essentially looking at um, how other ways that we could possibly allow the person. Next slide. So again, step three is the key. That is, um, you know, that is great for us as um, disability adjudicators. If we can again allow someone at step three, they can you know receive um, benefits right away. We, again, we're looking at whether or not we have the sufficient evidence to support that, and usually. Um, again, that's going to be, uh, the evidence is going to be the testing or imaging that we may need. Um, and if, if that information is given to us from an acceptable medical source. And um, we're also looking at the, the functional information. Is it consistent um, with the impairment and what the allegations are? Um, next slide, please. So SSA listings of impairments, what are the listings? It is a list of a disa disabling impairments organized by body system. It lists specific criteria under which claimants who experience them may qualify medically for Social Security disability benefits. And the listing and the, or the blue book is important to us because it's essentially our roadmap. Um, 
it gives if if we're not able to again meet that person um, it can give us direction on how to further develop that claim or to even determine the severity of it so we want to be sure that um, that we're looking that we're referencing our listings with every claim and we're referencing every condition if that person has multiple conditions we want to be sure that we are referencing all the impairments that are in correlation with um, that listing. Um, next slide. So next slide will give you the where you can find the actual blue book, the medical listings. There's going to be 14 listings to include 12.0, uh, which is the mental disorders. The other disorders are physical. And each listing, if you um, were were to click on each one under the um, SSA website, you're going to get um, an introduction to those that particular body system. You're going to get the criteria for how to meet that listing, the documentation that's required, and some terminology on how SSA defines um, some of the information that are that is within those listings. Next slide. Again, um, that's where you can access the Blue Book. And again, there's, there's 14 body systems. The mental disorders are found under Section 12.0. Um, it is important to remember that a specific diagnosis that someone has received over the years are not as important as the signs, the signs and symptoms. So we want to be sure, we're looking for consistency. We want to be sure that the um, reported signs and symptoms are consistent with the medical evidence, the diagnosis, and um, the, the impairment and how we are going to, to reference those or refer them to, how we're going to reference them in the Blue Book, I'm sorry. Um, again, so functioning is essentially key. So as SOAR representatives, um, it's important that when you do submit application that you, if you are able to provide that information, um, the functional information, if you are able to get the testing beforehand, um, the imaging that supports that severe impairment or supports that listing, it's important that you have that information and, and refer immediately to that blue, that blue book to determine um, the, if this claimant meets the listing. And, and you bas basically will be able to determine how quickly you are able to get a favorable decision on that claim as well. Next slide. So this is the overview of the mental disorder listings for adults. Um, some of the most common ones that we often see or are going to evaluate claimants on, I guess it depends on um, the area, but um, 1203, 1204, um, and the 1206. Those are common listings that are, that are referenced. Um, so the requirements. We are, for most categories or disorders, um, the, the claimant can meet the listing with the symptom criteria listed in A and the level of functioning severity in listed B. So the, we're looking at three different paragraphs under each listing. Um, next slide, please. So paragraph A is going to define or um, basically really it is, it's going to identify the medical criteria that must be present in the medical evidence. The B criteria is going to be the functional information, um, how we assess the, um, the severity of their functioning. And the C criteria is used to evaluate um, the, the serious and persist the, the persistence of it. We're looking at a documented history over, over two years um, to meet that C criteria. And this applies to all of the orders except 1205. The 1205 intellectual disorders, um, there are going to be IQ scores associate, associated with um, that particular listing. And we're looking for, for adults, we're looking to see if the IQs were obtained at um, age 18 and if, it's consist if those IQ scores are consistent, again, with functioning. Next slide. So there's four areas of mental functioning. 
uh, the ability to understand, remember, or apply information, the ability to interact with others, the ability to concentrate, persist, or maintain pace, and the ability to adapt or manage oneself. Uh, for DDS to determine that a person is disabled under mental disorders, there must be marked limitations in two areas of mental functioning or extreme limitations in one area. The medical condition must um, significantly limit their ability to do basic work activities. And then um, in addition to, um, oh, I'm sorry, when we, when we define like basic work activities, we're looking at their ability to remember, understand, and carry out simple instructions, um, the ability to respond appropriately to super supervisors, coworkers, or even the public. Next slide. How, B, how the B functional criteria is used to evaluate mental disorders. So to satisfy the B criteria, your mental disorder must result in an extreme limitation of one or marked limitation of two of the four areas of mental functioning using a five-point rating scale. So no limitation would be that they're able to function. Mild limitations, um, slightly limited in their functioning. Moderate limitation would be fair. Marked, serious, and extreme, not able to function at all. So limitation reflects the degree to which your mental disorder interferes with your ability to function independently, appropriately, effectively and on a sustained basis. That um, is basically what we're looking for as far as meeting the C criteria. If there is um, evidence of a two-year history of treatment and this person is not able to function independently, meaning that they need supervision to carry out their ADLs or they need supervision to make sure that they're compliant with um, medication, they're not able to go out alone, that is how we basically rate um, that C criteria. Next slide. Combination of impairments. Applicants um, can be approved based on a combination of impairments, so we can consider and document both mental and physical impairments. Common physical impairments found in applicants experiencing homelessness covered in the following slides. Next slide, please. So the uh, first listing that is addressed in the Blue Book is the musculoskeletal system, listing 1.0. Next slide. And basically, um, with listing 1.0, or I would, I would say not just this listing, and most of the listings, um, function is important. With, with listing 1.0, we are looking at um, the loss of function. Has there been a loss of function? Is there evidence of in, uh, some form of uh, joint deformity, bone deformity, deformity? Are there back disorders or arthritis? If there's evidence of an amputation, fracture, or uh, possibly a burn that is inhibiting their ability to um, be mobile. Next slide. So one of the key things that we are looking for under listing 1.0, especially if it's affecting um, their, their lower extremities, is their ability to ambulate effectively. Um, is there an extreme limitation for their ability to walk? Meaning, does it interfere with their ability to independently initiate, sustain, or complete activities? Um, do they require a handheld device? And to what extreme? Do they need that handheld device to actually get up from a sitting position? Do they need it um, for, you know, in, to get to move around the home? Or do they need it only when they're outside of the home? Next slide. These are some exam examples of an effect of ambulation. So inability to walk without a use of um, a walker, meaning that essentially they are not stable on their feet without a use of a walker, two crutches, or two canes. Um, inability to walk 
a block at a, at a reasonable pace, inability to use uh, standard public transportation, and to carry out routine ambulatory activities such as shopping and baking, and um, limitations in their ability just to take um, a few steps at a reasonable place without the use of a single handrail. Next slide, please. There's also, um, we also consideration of loose, the, I'm sorry, the loss of function in the upper extremities um, that may impair their ability to complete activities. So we are looking at um, a loss of uh, grip, grip strength, um, motor strength, range of motion. Next slide. Hi, Jennifer. Did we get disconnected? Hello? Hi, is this Jennifer? Yes, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, we can hear you now. We may have gotten disconnected momentarily. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, what slide? Uh, examples of ineffective fine and gross movements. Okay. Okay, so um, when we're looking at loss of function in the upper extremities, we're looking at their ability to carry out their ADLs. Um, can they take care of their personal hygiene? Do they have difficulty with dressing, such as buttoning their clothes or tying their shoelaces? Um, is their ability to actually um, handle papers or files and even writing? We're looking at if, if a claimant writes out their own um, like ADLs, we're looking at you know, the, is it legible, you know, those are some of the things that we are observing to determine the severity of their impairment affecting their hands. Next slide. So listing 104, disorders of the spine, that is one of the most common referenced um, listings for um, adult claims. There are multiple impairments that are evaluated under 104. Uh, some of the common ones would be the degenerative disc disease, um, the spinal stenosis, herniated disc. Next slide. So um, typically, uh, the effects of obesity can exacerbate someone's pain level, contribute to um, you know, slow healing process if someone has, has undergone surgery or something. Um, so we also consider that even though they may not have a listing level condition, condition if they are obese, and we, we're typically looking at a BMI of greater than 40 or, or greater, we have to consider how their, their weight could be contributing or exacerbating that situation or making their mobility um, their the ability to, to, to be mobile even greater. Like, what are the effects of, of obesity? So that is one of the things that we, we look at when we're also evaluating physical conditions, the effects of obesity. Next slide. So what are the, some of the things that we're looking for uh, to determine a listing level condition related to the musculoskeletal um, body system? would be um, range of motion. Is there a lack of range of motion? Is there um, evidence of a severe impairment without imaging? So we, have, we need the imaging for MDI, but without the imaging, does the medical evidence show um, or mention abnormality, such as the heat, the swelling, um, or the deformity? Is there evidence of a possible um, amputation? Um, so if, if, there, if that is the case, then there's certain situations where we don't require or need the actual imaging if there is visible evidence of a severe impairment. Next slide. So as we're um, assessing the back impairments, again, we're looking at the range of motion of the spine. We're looking to see if there are any um, uh, 
decrease, if there's any decreased sensation or motor loss in any of the extremities. We're looking for a gait description. We're looking to see if there is a need for um, a cane or an other assistive, assistive device. Um, with the cane use, a lot of claimants will get their own claim. We do look at their statements for how it's used, but typically we need a physician to tell us if that cane or other assistive device is medically necessary for that person. Next slide. So respiratory disorders, 3.0. Some of the, uh, well, two of the most common conditions that we're looking at in 3.0 would be the COPD and asthma. The COPD, we reference listing 302 for chronic respiratory disorders. Uh, 303 is the asthma. Under listing 302, there is a reference table that we refer to when we're trying to determine the, um, the severity of it or if the claimant actually meets the listing under 302. Basically, that table references values that we are only able to obtain through a pulmonary function study. So if the claimant has, if they have a treating pulmonary doctor and they have these conditions, that is something that we are looking for. We're looking for a pulmonary function study. There are times where we will have to uh, schedule one for the claimant. Um, so in addition to uh, the testing, and imaging that is required, we're going to be looking at the frequency of exacerbations requiring ER visits or hospitalizations. And it's also critical for us to know if that person is requiring home oxygen. If they do, we, we would need to know the extent of it. Is it required 24-7? Um, do they have a mobile one that they, you know, they're able to take outside of the home, or are they only using it at, at night to to get through the nights to be able to sleep. That's important for us to know. Um, next slide, please. So if cardiac listings and impairments are under listing uh, 4.0, next slide. Um, so we're looking at any disorder that affects the proper functioning of the heart or circulatory system. Uh, what are the results from consequences of heart disease? Um, I'm sorry, the results from consequences of heart disease. So some of the common conditions we're looking at are, the, are chronic heart failure, ischemic heart disease, and chronic venous insufficiency. Um, the, we're looking at the, the signs as well as the symptoms and how they are affecting their ability to function. So the, the common listings that we reference would be 402, which is the congestive heart failure, 404, which is ischemic heart disease. Under that listing is where we evaluate coronary artery disease. And 411, the chronic venous insufficiency, where, um, which is common, a common listing that um, we see for the brony edema, uh, the status dermatitis and ulcers that have not healed or responded to treatment after three months. Next slide, please. So the documentation that is needed. So in addition to the signs and symptoms, we're looking for the history. We're looking at physical examination, um, the laboratory findings, the um, testing that has been done, echocardiogram, and we want to know how they have responded to treatment. Um, if someone has undergone a, um, a, a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass graft, if they have suffered a, a heart attack, then we are going to look for an examination three months following that event. Um, there are rare cases where we, we will order the testing if needed. Next slide. So again, um, with um, the cardiac and respiratory and musculoskeletal, we are, with each of those listings, we consider the effects of obesity. 
again, we're looking at a BMI of greater than 40, and how the obesity, again, is, a, is hindering their ability to heal and hindering their ability to function because of these other conditions. So even if they may not meet one of those listings, a combination of their impairments could still allow them benefits or we could still deem them disabled based on a combination of those impairments to include the obesity. And I believe that is it. So I will... Thank Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Jennifer had mentioned that she could do a full day training on just the orthopedic listings and even the orthopedic listings. So she really uh, pared down her presentation uh, due to time constraints, but I know Jennifer would really encourage you, and we always encourage you to check out the blue book, uh, the listings of impairments. We know that um, the, most of you are very familiar with the uh, mental health disorder listings, the 12.0 listings, but we encourage you to dig deeper uh, when you have applicants with a combination of impairments, which may include, um, you know, cardiac issues, respiratory and orthopedic issues due to the years of uh, individuals living on the streets. Uh, these were the impairments that Jennifer finds uh, that come up with SOAR applicants. So we really encourage you to, um, you know, take a look at some of the other listings that Jennifer talked about. So again, we do appreciate you. Um, uh, touching on these listings uh, for our SOAR community. So now I'd like to turn it over to Meg um, with the Homeless Advocacy Project HAP, who's going to now talk about um, those grids, step five, which is uh, probably a new um, area for folks. So I'm going to hand it over to Meg. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Meg Retz. I'm an attorney at the Homeless Advocacy Project, where I have been handling SOAR claims for about the past 10 years. Um, I am here to talk with you today about some of the basics of what the grids are and how to apply them in SOAR claims. So step five, we skipped over step four today. Now we're at step five. Can the claimant perform other work? And the first place we're going to look um, is at two factors, the claimant's residual functional capacity and then vocational factors, including the applicant's age, education, and work experience. So just a reminder about what the RFC is, the residual functional capacity. It's a case-by-case -case determination based on the evidence in the file, and it considers the symptoms resulting from all of the ailments the claimant experiences, both physical and mental health impairments, and that also includes and extends to things like pain um, and side effects from medications, things like that. The, the Social Security Administration determines the RFC based on what the claimant can do in spite of those limitations, so in spite of the limitations resulting from those physical and mental health impairments. Social Security developed these guidelines to reflect major functional and vocational patterns, and the guidelines are called the GRIDs. And what they are is they're just a numbered set of rules. They're a chart that we're going to look at in a few minutes. And if you follow the instructions of how to use the chart, you're going to end up with a result, either disabled or not disabled, depending on whether the factors in the rule are, uh, are met. So here is the citation for the grids, um, but how I find the grids is I just Google SSA grids, and it's the first thing that pops up. You'll click on the first link that pops up with SSA grids, and it'll bring you right to the grids with some introductory information and the charts that we're going to talk about in a moment. How applicable are the grids to the case that you're looking at? So the grids are, oops, did I skip a slide? No. Sorry, bear with me. This is my first time doing this. Uh, this program. So I'm having trouble forwarding the slide. Sure, I can do that for you, Meg. So now the grid. Oh, there, I just got it. There we go. Okay. Thank you. So how applicable are the grids uh, to this claim? And so the thing to remember is that grids are primarily applied in claims where there are exertional limitations. So limitations resulting from um, limited physical strength. So that's going to be things like sitting, standing, lifting, and carrying, things like that. The SSI applies the rule based on exertional limitations as defined by the RFC. So what's left after we look, we take away everything the claimant can no longer do. And then they're going to put that RFC into one of four categories, sedentary work, light work, medium work, or heavy work, depending on what the person's residual functional capacity allows them to do. 
the grids are not fully applicable if the limitations are non-exertional. So non-exertional would be things that are resulting not strength-based, things that are potentially more based on things like a mental illness. And so you'll see the, on this slide the examples of exertional limitations and then non-exertional limitations that might be, as I said, the result of a mental illness. And that would be things like limitations in the ability to concentrate, to relate to the public, to respond to criticism from a supervisor, etc. So those things that we're often used to looking at in the mental health listings. Then we're going to decide with this claim, am I, how am I going to use the grids? How are the grids going to apply to this claimant situation? So the Social Security Administration is always going to look at the grids first. If they can make an allowance or a finding that the claiming, claimant is disabled using a grid rule, because that person has exertional limitations that would result in a finding of disability, they're going to use that rule. And so as an advocate, if we think that the claimant is disabled under the grids, we are going to say, yes, the grids apply here 100%. The person is disabled under the grid rule. Claim approved. Great. If the claimant is not disabled under the grid rule that would, you would find from looking at their non-exertional limitations, then what we're going to do as an advocate is we're going to say, this claimant is not disabled under the grid rule, but they have significant non-exertional limitations, for example, like those resulting from serious mental illness, and then we're going to argue that the grid rule does not apply to this case and that more analysis needs to occur. So we're going to take a look right now at what the grids actually look like. So this is what you'll see um, after you read the introductory information when you Google that SSA grids and click on the first link. And you'll see that these are charts. And there's going to be four different charts that you um, will see on this page. And it's going to be the sedentary chart, the light work chart, the medium work chart, and the heavy work chart. And I'm just going to turn on, hopefully, oh, maybe not. Hold on the pointer bear with me laser pointer there we go <laughs> um, so I'm just going to point out some of the areas on the chart that you are going to be looking at as you're doing your analysis so as I mentioned earlier the RFC determines the chart that you're looking at so the light chart the medium chart um, I'm sorry, the sedentary chart, the light chart, the medium chart, or the heavy chart. And then we're going to look at those three vocational factors I mentioned earlier. So we're going to look at the person's age, we're going to look at their level of education, and then we're going to look at their previous work experience. There are, um, on most of the charts, there are three categories of age. And um, when I do this training for our volunteers, they're always a little appalled at how age is defined. So we have younger individuals that are 45 to 49, and then we have closely approaching advanced age. That would be anyone over 50. And then advanced age, that would be anyone over 55. Um, on the medium and heavy charts, there's a an additional category um, that I'm not going to really touch on today. That's closely approaching retirement age. That's anyone over 60. Um, and then there are some additional rules for people with very, very low levels of education, lower than sixth grade. But for our purposes today, our we're going to take a look at this. Sorry. We're going to take a look at this sedentary chart. Um, and we're going to look at it based on age education and past work experience. And we'll just go through some examples. So say we have a claimant who is 52 years old. So we're going to look at their age. That would be closely approaching advanced age. And then we're going to look at their education level and say this person has less than a high school degree, as many of our HAP clients do. So then they would have limited or less education because they don't have a high school degree or more, limited or less. And then look at their past work. Is their past work either unskilled or none? And so that would be no uh, SGA level work in the past. 15 years, and we're just going to follow our finger right over on the chart, closely ad ad approaching advanced age, limited or less education, unskilled or none past work, and the finding is disabled. And then if you look over here, that's the rule that is making that finding of disability. So on this chart, there's a couple of interesting things that I just want to point out to you. First is this little shorthand, DO, and what that means is ditto. So that means whatever is above. So for example, over here, ditto would be limited or less, the same thing. Over here would be a finding of disabled. Then down here, not disabled, disabled, and so on, just based on the age, education, and past work. One of the ways that we use this chart at HAP is both, you know, arguing, of course, in individual cases where there are serious uh, physical limitations, especially for people who are older, but we also use this chart to explain to some of our clients and some of our collaborators why different people get different outcomes under Social Security rules. So this would explain why someone who applies when they are, for example, 49 with the same ailments might get a different result when they apply again 
one year later when they're 50. And it's because one year later, a different grid rule will apply in their case. This also helps clients who, um, a common rumor we hear is that you have to apply for Social Security and be denied two or three times before your claim will be approved. Um, and what I try to explain to people is sometimes what that actually is, is just getting older. And so a different grid rule will apply on the third time you apply for disability when you're in your mid-50s versus the first time you apply for disability when you're a younger person, maybe 45. Um, and so we use the grids in lots of different ways. And then, like I said, other times we say that the grids don't apply because it's a claimant that has primarily mental health issues, non-exertional limitations. The grids aren't going to be helpful for that claimant, especially someone who's younger or has a higher level of education. And then we're going to focus more on the limitations from their mental health symptoms. I think that's all I've got for now, so I'm going to hand it back over to Pam. Great. Thanks so much, um, uh, Meg, for introducing the SOAR community to the grids. We get questions a lot about what are these grids, so I think you showed visually what they look like, but also how you apply the grids. Um, so thanks again for introducing this to the SOAR community. So now we're going to pass it along to Denise, who's going to talk about, provide some case studies on how she utilizes both the listings and the grids. Meg? I mean, Denise, sorry. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so I am a benefit and entitlement specialist at BEST, which stands for just that, Benefit and Entitlement Specialist Team, at Central City Concern in Portland, Oregon, a nonprofit. Um, in addition, I do uh, community liaison work, which means I train the community partners. So I'm training them on how to refer to us. So. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about some practical uses. So using the listings, how does this work out when we're actually in the trenches building a case? Um, no. Some best practices that have worked in the past. Okay. Another person on the phone, but okay. Um, so best practices would be reviewing a situation, or reviewing okay, time, yeah, looking yeah. at what the um, most okay. significant yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, are. When training someone new to yeah. our program, no, no, building no. cases, typically the guidance is to print out that listing and use that while you're reading through medical records, um, looking for the criteria, highlighting things that meet the criteria, and then tagging them with a little flag in records so you can refer back to them later. Um, this can be really useful when you're writing your MSR or if you're asking a provider to write a letter of support, you can specifically reference the things that are important to meeting the criteria of that particular listing. Um, typically when you're writing your MSR, what we're trained to do is um, we talk about the client's report, the functional impairment, and we can echo that by citing evidence from the medical records, including the date, the location, the provider, and what they're seeing that echoes what the client is reporting. Um, so that's one piece on using the actual listings. Um, when you're writing them in, there's that layered piece. As you heard earlier, um, there needs to be both that criteria as well as the functional impairment. And so as you can see on this slide, it's basically using the evidence that supports their statements or your observations or um, basically can echo multiple providers that would indicate that there is indeed a functional impairment. Um, and then citing the evidence, the date, the location, so that it's easier for an analyst at DDS to verify what you're stating in your MSR. Um, the work experience portion of the MSR is pretty important in that um, you can use the Occupational Information Network link. I use it all the time. I find it incredibly useful because you don't, there's no way to possibly know all of the things that each type of work that your clients have done entails. Um, for example, I had a client that worked with forklifts and, you know, first thought in forklifts, you're thinking they sit predominantly, they move an arm, they steer. Well, in actuality, 
by DDS definition, you have to be able to use judgment, you have to be able to use hands and feet simultaneously. There's a bunch of things that you don't necessarily think about in your client's past relevant work where you want to be able to know what their job actually requires and then be able to use the evidence to show where they can no longer do those things. So an example that I put on here was the construction that was um, including unloading and loading trucks, hoisting materials, erecting, assembling scaffolding, I mean, things that, that unless you have a career in that field, not necessarily something that you're thinking of. And so it becomes really helpful when you're using the grid or you're using the um, RCF to say, all right, they're limited now to say light or sedentary work, therefore they can't possibly do past relevant work because look at the level of physicality involved in those jobs. Um, so it can be really useful. Um, we refer to this dictionary, I guess it would be called, um, fairly often. I can give an example of when it was really useful. Um, I had a client who was in the advanced age category and um, she was denied at initial because it was stated that her past relevant work of janitorial work was in fact light, not medium. Therefore, despite her cardiac issues, she could still do that job. Well, it was there's um, a link, many links. Um, there's a link to the definition of light, medium, heavy work. And so I did some research and found her very detailed work history from her initial and was able to write that um, the light duty requires um, no less than 20 pounds and a frequency of no less than 10 pounds for lifting. And then I went in online and decided to find out how much an industrial garbage can weighed, how much a ladder weighed, all the things that were included in her job description. And in fact, the work she was doing fell under the medium category. So that if there wasn't really evidence to change the um, level of her work and she was allowed at the reconsideration level. So it can be really useful when you're trying to be specific and point out like, what a client has done and cannot do, do in the future. Um, so here is another example that I thought might be useful. And they might not always meet all of the medical criteria, but when you add that residual functional capacity and the past relevant work, you can sometimes find out that they do meet. An example is I had a client that, again, was in the advanced age category, and she was, I was looking under 302, so chronic respiratory disorder. She, indeed, what I thought met the lifting in that she had three instances of respiratory failure, each resulting in a hospitalization lasting 48 hours, at least 30 days apart during one calendar year, which is what is described in this particular criteria portion of the listing. And it was denied by the medical doctor because she was not always medication adherent. So we then defuncted to the grid. And it was really helpful because because of her condition, she's limited to sedentary work, except all of her past relevant work was in factories, quality inspection in an automotive part plant, and she could not return to any of those jobs. They were deemed unskilled, and therefore there were no transferable skills, and so she fell into disabled um, because she could not do her past relevant work, and based on age and education level, she wasn't going to learn a new job and we found an allowance through the grid. Um, so it can be really helpful, especially when you're working with an older population. Um, so again, the advanced age is, like, it's helpful. Um, it does not mean that this only works on folks who are 55 and older in all their cases. Um, but one thing that I can say when we are screening clients or meeting with them for the first time, if a person is of advanced age and does not have a high school diploma and they're limited in their work and they had a past history of unskilled work or skills that aren't transferable, the MedVoc grid is really helpful. Um, our population that we serve traditionally has a history of homelessness, traditionally has a history of temporary jobs um, or unskilled jobs. 
labor type pieces, a lot of physical labor type pieces, and the grid can be useful. Um, another example is I had a client who was 60 degrees, 60 years old, excuse me. He did not have a high school diploma and his history was all manual labor. He had a vascular insult to the brain and was unable to have vision out of one of his eyes, therefore could no longer do his past relevant work. Um, he was limited to sedentary work. He did not have any history of sedentary work and without having a high school diploma and at his age, again, the grids, he gridded out as we call it, um, allowed us to find um, an allowance in his case um, based on that information. It's very useful. Um, I think that you kind of have to interweave the three pieces, the listings, the grids, and I also would recommend finding the tidbits and putting, saving them into your search bar. I have the Medvoke grid saved. There's a piece on um, the definition of skills, whether it be unskilled, skilled. It will break them down as to what transferable skills are. Um, the dictionary of occupations, again, is incredibly helpful because it will help you think of all of the things that you never thought of would be attributed to doing a certain job. Um, and then, again, being able to list off some of the things that your client is no longer able to do. Um, and I think that is all I have for you. Great. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, we appreciate it. And showing how you do apply the listings and the grids and in combination with each other too. Um, and sharing a great resource on how to figure out, um, you know, categorizing the individual's uh, skill level um, mm -hmm. and the strengths demands of a job. Uh, again, that's something new to folks. Um, and again, we could probably spend a day just on how to how to review the dictionary of occupational titles or that ONET link that you shared. I would really encourage folks to click that on and uh, just take a deeper dive. Uh, if you're working with an applicant, plug in the job uh, that they are uh, telling you that they've done and see and look to see where you can um, you know figure out their strength level and and what skill level uh, that job was and how you can add that to your medical summary reports um, and your functional descriptions uh, for the individual. So thank you so much um, to all of our presenters for adding some new information uh, to the SOAR community. So we have plenty of time now uh, mm -hmm. to open things up for Q&A. Um, so you can pose your questions to the panelists by typing in um, to the Q&A box. You can type those questions in there. And um, what we'll do is um, I'll pose them to the panelists. Um, so you can start typing in some of your questions. Um, and again, if we can't get to all the questions, uh, we'll be sure to follow up um, with an answer um, afterwards. We'll be able to do that. But we had a couple of questions that came in because this is so new, thinking about work and categorizing it, um, like understanding the skill level, the strength level. Um, can you talk to us, and, I, and I'll pose this to all of the presenters, and I'll start with Jennifer at DDS, um, how important it is do you utilize the grids? Are you looking at the grids um, at DDS? Or is this something that is utilized at the hearing level? How do you utilize the grids um, to help somebody at that uh, step five? And I'll start with Jennifer about that. Uh, yes, we are using the grids. Um, it's a very, the step five is the most complex part of what we what we do. Um, if usually typically when we get a claim, if they don't meet or equal listing, we're looking at their age, we're looking at their education, we're looking at their work experience to determine where they would fall in the grid. Um, we're looking, so, you know, in evaluating the impairments and the medical evidence, we're looking to see, well, um, what RFC could possibly allow this person um, benefits. It, does the medical evidence support that RFC to, you know, be able to allow this person benefit? So yes, in, in every claim where a person is 50 or older or um, uh, 
have unskilled work and they're illiterate and can't speak, read English, then we're going to this grid to determine if they um, are disabled. There are some instances where we don't have to go to the grid because either way, you're going to, you know, if they're a younger individual and they've been given um, an RFC for medium work, we, we know that that person is not disabled. But we have to go to the grid if there is um, a question of whether or not this person can be determined disabled because of those vocational factors and the RFC. Okay. Thanks. Um, we I have a question about um, you had mentioned um, in, when you were discussing, Jennifer, the orthopedic listing using a cane. Um, often applicants um, have a cane, but it's not something that's prescribed. Uh, maybe they, they, a, a social worker uh, provided one to them, um, and how, how is that best documented? Uh, and should the individual get a prescription for a cane so that it becomes part of their medical file? Um, because this person notices that they use it both inside and outside. So how important is it to get that information to Social Security if they don't currently have a prescription for one? It is important, but it may not, depending on, you know, the, the, um, the condition, it may, you know, we understand a lot of the, 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 you know, the individuals that are in the homeless community, they may not necessarily get the treatment that they need, and so they will borrow a cane or someone will give them a cane. And so it's not um, prescribed. But what we're looking for, if we can't determine from the medical evidence if the cane is needed, then we would have to get an examination and we're gonna ask that doctor to say whether or not that cane is medically needed. So even, I mean, I've, I've seen medical records where the person used a cane that may not have been um, prescribed by the doctor, but if the doctor is able to make a statement as to whether or not that person can ambulate effectively without it. If they're giving us some type of description, that helps us make, you know, a determination of how, you know, if that person actually needs that cane and how it's going to affect their ability to function. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question, and this could be for Jennifer too. Um, when is it considered severe in step two of the sequential evaluation to move to step three? We get this a lot because of that word severe. Can you just describe what um, SSA means by severe? <laughs> yeah, so what we're uh, severe, we're looking at, um, so for instance, if, if imaging says somebody has mild degenerative disc disease, and we are looking at the evidence. They have um, normal, normal examinations, normal range of motion. Um, they don't report any loss of functioning. You know, they're not reporting any limitations. We would consider that non severe. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Um, here's a question uh, that can go to um, any of the panelists. Um, it's a question about a combination of impairment. So when you're using a combination of, of the listings uh, to meet the threshold, how much of each listing criteria does the applicant need to meet? Um, um, applicant need to meet, or is it simply that the combo of impairments reaches marked or extreme limitations? I think there's a lot in that question to unpack, um, but, can you just describe, you know, you have the listing. Does the person need to meet all of the listing or just some of the listing? And maybe, um, Jen, you can take that one again. Okay. Um, in order, so in order to meet the listing, yes, they would have to meet that criteria of the listing. When we say medically equal the listing, um, that is where, you know, someone may, may meet one part of the listing. We may not have the documentation to support that they meet another part of the listing. So we could say that person medically equals that listing. Or um, if, if they don't, or they say if they have multiple impairments that are close to listing level, then we can say with a combination of impairments, they could possibly 
medical mm -hmm. people, or they could just be in a functional, you know, um, with the multiple impairment, they don't have the ability to function in, in a normal eight hour, 40 hour work week. Um, thanks for that, Jennifer. This is uh, Does anyone have anything to add to what Jennifer said, the other panelists? Okay, this is a question that has come up because uh, the medical summary report, which is a SOAR product, it's really critical to um, submitting a completed SOAR assisted application is to write up a, a medical summary report or an MSR. Some folks also call them functional descriptions. Uh, but there are a bunch of questions about that. One person said they don't do MSRs. Um, how should we document that information in another way? And we'll just use this, um, you know, as a, a kind of a platform to really encourage you to begin writing up MSRs. Um, we have some great tools on our SOAR website on how to organize an MSR. We have sample MSRs. Um, um, so we really encourage you to, to begin writing an MSR. And if that's something new or you're struggling with, please reach out to your SOAR, um, you know, state or local leads or your SOAR TA set liaison who could really assist you um, with the writing of an MSR by providing some feedback um, and, and to do a review for you. So this question comes up, and we get it a lot, is should you directly reference the Grizz and Blue Book in the MSR? Um, and I'm going to throw that out to uh, Meg. Um, we certainly suggest individuals not to say, if, if you're at the initial level or reconsideration level, the case is at DDS, is not to say, you know, um, you know, the applicant meets listing 12.04. Um, it's rather telling their story, laying out the evidence, or laying out examples and citing to the evidence on why they meet the listing rather than um, explicitly spelling it out, you know, uh, literally. Um, and also with the grids, you know, uh, by indicating that the individual, it, their age, you know, this is a 54-year-old individual with a less than high school education and past work as a, you know, truck driver, which is, you know, semi-skilled or whatever that might be, you know, lay it out that way. Tell the person's story. Um, so that's what we say. I just wanted to get some comment from, you know, Meg and also Denise about that too. What is your, how do you write those MSRs and how do you cite to the grids and the listings? Yeah, absolutely. This is Meg from HAP. Um, so I just want to say, uh, so I may use the word function letter. That's what we call an MSR here. Um, and we generally submit one of those in every single claim that we submit, but it is not always long. So if the evidence in a claim is really strong, we might submit a letter describing that information, the, pointing to the key pieces in the evidence that is only a page and a half. Um, so if there's lots and lots of good, strong evidence, we feel like we can do a much shorter letter, um, tell a little less of the story and just point directly to the evidence. So when we do the functional report or the functional letters in our claims, um, we are, are kind of in the middle of where you're talking about, Pam. So we don't, I have never cited a uh, uh, listing or a grid specifically by number in any of the letters that we've submitted. But when I am arguing a listings case, I usually do follow the, I do mirror the exact form of the grid. So, or I'm sorry, the of the listing. So for example, I would write an introductory paragraph that would uh, state the diagnosis and the symptoms that line up and align with the symptoms listed in the listing. And then I would tell, basically tell a uh, lengthy or not lengthy, depending on the claim, history of the person's situation, how they got where they are, what they're experiencing now. And then I actually do use the headings um, that go along with Part B of the mental health listings. So I'm not saying they meet or equal this specific listing, but I am certainly lining up examples that mirror the categories in the order of the listings. That's just my habit and how I like to do it. We also submit letters that don't use that format and are just as effective. Similarly with the grids, um, I don't don't ever cite a grid, but I do outline, you know, I know what the grid's rules are, and I am making a grid's argument without citing the specific grids. Um, so when we're not at the hearing level, I wouldn't cite the grid. Okay. Do the other panelists have um, additional comments? 
This is Denise. I'd like to add, like, likewise, I don't cite what the listing is, and we also um, cite those Part B pieces. They are categories in our functional summaries as well, and it's a real good opportunity to, based on the functional interview with the client, write down some of their functional impairments, and then there's usually an echo of that or support of that within the medical evidence that you can add to the functional summary um, that gives their statements more credibility. I, I agree. Just to add to that, one of the things that I say when we train our volunteers is I say that I want in that function letter, I want my client to be able to speak for themselves and describe their own experiences, but I, with my knowledge of the listings, am guiding that conversation. I think that's a great summation, and it, it is also an opportunity to put into the person's story evidence that won't necessarily be requested by DDS based on the time frame, but evidence that's still relevant to the person's conditions and functionality in the now. Okay, great. Excellent advice. We appreciate that. So for the individual that posed the question who's not currently doing MSRs, um, um, hopefully um, you know, using hearing them described as a functional letter, functional description makes it less scary, and you can see the value in that MSR or functional description. And we really encourage you to begin, um, you know, to write um, to write up um, the medical summary report because they are very valuable in telling the applicant's story and providing very specific, detailed information about their limitations um, that is often not in the medical records. Um, so here is a question. Um, it's very specific to the um, disorders of the spine. So I'm going to give this to Jennifer, and if you can answer it, great. Um, it has to do, I guess, the individual is seeing this pop up in the medical records, because we're not doctors. <laughs> so sometimes, um, you know, it can be very clinical and hard to understand. Uh, but this is in the 1.04 disorders of the spine. It references positive straight leg raising tests sitting and supine. Are they looking for there to be a positive test in both sitting and standing or just in one or the other? How much weight does this test carry? So I guess they're raising a straight leg, positive straight leg raising test. Is this that something you can answer? I mean, um, we're typically looking at one or the other. You know, we're, we're not, I mean, if we, if we look at an exam and we see positive straight leg, you know, raising tests, and I mean, we're not looking, oh, is it both, you know, just basically just supporting the severity of it. And if it's, you know, if it's consistent with everything else, I mean, that, that, would, that mm -hmm. would satisfy the listing. Okay, great. Just match it up with what you see in the listing for that test. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one, Jennifer, about um, testing ordered by DDS. Does DDS order uh, consultative exams um, or testing such as MRIs? Um, what, and what other type of testing is, do you do for a respiratory test other than a pulmonary function test? Okay, um, it, it is specific to the state. I will say that not every DDS will approve, you know, testing across, you know, the board. Um, just depend, it depends on that DDS and depends on what that agency is allowing. Um, typically, we don't do MRIs or CAT scans, they're an X-ray. Um, like there's some testing that is done in the state of Nevada that we didn't do in Michigan, where I'm from. So like um, a chest X-ray or an actual echocardiogram, um, some of the, um, the lower extremity ultrasounds. Um, that testing is specific here that wasn't done in Michigan. So again, it just depends on that particular state and what that agency will allow. Okay. Essentially, you don't do, and I think one of your slides says you don't do any invasive testing. Correct. Or if, well, that is, that is true, and typically we would have to get an approval. We have to have a doctor to say that that person is able to do a test. Like someone that is dependent on oxygen, we don't want to subject them to a pulmonary function study or subject them to um, 
someone with you know with a heart condition and you know it's so severe where they can't even do a stress test we're not going to subject them to that um you know to cause them any harm <laughs> Right, right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question that could be for you, Jennifer, too. Would the grid apply when there is no medical documents available? I assist those who are experiencing homelessness and some do not have medically, medical documents to cover their condition. Should I proceed in preparing their application with no medical evidence? I'll start with Jennifer and then others may want to um, kind of chime in. Uh, the grid doesn't say, I'll let you talk about that. Would the grid apply, so we're assuming it's a person maybe over 50, when there is no medical documents available? Well, I, I would say yes. Um, we would still, when it, when it comes to that step, so if they don't have medical treatment, there's no medical documentation, then we're required to get an examination so that we can make an assessment. We have to make a medical assessment. So that would be, you know, the, the step two of it. And then, you know, depending on their age, education, and background, then we then we would refer to the grid when it's time to make that decision. If they don't meet a medical equal listing, then we, we're going to the grid after we have obtained that medical doc documentation. And we need to we need and, and once we've rated them. Once we've rated them is when we go to the grid. Okay. Um, Meg here, I'm just going to jump in on that question, um, because we do occasionally submit a SOAR claim for someone who lacks medical treatment, but it is in situations where the claimant's conditions are so severe that we are 100% confident that both they will um, attend a consultative exam, so they're able to, we're able to maintain contact with them and they're able to attend a consultative exam, and that the findings of that consultative exam will very likely show that they're disabled. So it's, it's rare for us to submit those types of claims. Great. And this is another grid question. Um, and again, it goes back to, um, Jennifer, you just mentioned rating the case, and that may be a new uh, kind of a, a concept for folks. Um, so how do we determine the initial RFCs, the residual functional capacity, the RFC that shows us where to begin. Is this based on the RFC that comes from DDS? How do we determine RFC before that? Um, so maybe Meg, do you want to kind of handle that and then maybe Jennifer or Denise can kind of chime in? Sorry, can you just repeat the question, Pam? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a past question. Um, like how do we determine the initial RFC that shows us where to begin? How do you look at the RFC, Meg, when you're um, like looking at a case? So I suppose this is somewhat, my answer for this, I may not be the best person to answer this because we also handle <laughs> hearings. So we use a lot of medical source statements, which is a tool that is primarily used at hearings where a doctor completes a form um, that basically tells you what the RFC is. Um, and so we use those forms fairly regularly, even in our SOAR practice. And I don't know that other SOAR um, entities do that. Right. Right. So, Jennifer, how would you talk about determining the initial um, RFC? I don't know if I can lend any, <laughs> any yeah. information on that. It's really difficult because, um, I mean, as a, it, it just requires, you know, training. So as a trained adjudicator, I can look at evidence and say, okay, um, I believe, you know, this claimant, this claimant doesn't meet a listing, but I believe based on the evidence in file, that they have the residual functional capacity to perform light work. Um, once we make that determination, then we, we have to give it to a doctor to say, okay, I agree with you on that. You know, and it's the same thing when someone goes to a hearing. The judge is going to say, okay, even though there's a medical source statement in file, we receive medical source statements as well. We're saying, okay, we're considering what this doctor has said. Does the medical evidence support that? Then we have to have our doctor sign off and say, okay, yes, the medical evidence support that. So it's like you, you're really, it's, it's really hard for me to say how, to tell you how to rate someone without going into hours and hours of <laughs> training. Right. <laughs> right. So what type of evidence from the SOAR, um, you know, caseworker would be helpful for you in um, 
you know, looking at somebody's residual func functional capacity, what they have left over. Would that be more detailed explanation of the type of work they did and how well they did it? Um, you know, limitations that directly come from their impairments. How important is all of that taken together important for you um, to maybe make a step five allowance, for example? What kind of, how can SOAR uh, caseworkers um, really provide that level of detail to you? What, what advice would you give for them uh, to be um, more descriptive? I, I, I'm a great supporter of the MSR. I think that's a great tool to put, provide that information in. And basically, you know, we always tell, um, you know, a, a third party or someone to basically tell us a story, you know, give us a, um, a give us you know, in detail, what is going on with this claimant? Okay, so you're saying they have this impairment. What documentation do you have to, to um, support that impairment? Um, what type of treatment have they undergone? How have they responded to treatment? And then we're looking at what are the limitations that they're, you know, that they're um, alleging? And what are your observed limitations? What are the limitations that the claimant is reporting? Um, when you tell me that story, as I'm reading it, I'm kind of, you know, as an adjudicator, we're already, you know, thinking about, okay, the possibility of a listing level condition or the possibility of um, what the limitations are going to be. As we're reading this information, we're already thinking about how this person is limited. So, you know, as much information that you can provide, and you know, in that uh, that MSR, or even if you don't provide the MSR, if um, you do the collateral ADLs. There's a remarks section. You can provide detailed information there for us to be able, you know, to to make an accurate assessment. Great, that's wonderful. Um, how important it is um, then when you're writing your MSR and you're providing examples. Um, you talk about exertional limitations like sitting, standing, walking, lifting, carrying. How important it is for you to kind of quantify that, not necessarily, oh, they have trouble walking, um, you know, how important it is to say exactly how far they can walk or how much they can lift. Um, can maybe, Meg, can you talk about that in your MSRs? Do you, are, how specific are you with quantifying um, how often something occurs or, or how many pounds somebody can lift? Yeah, absolutely. I was already unmuting myself when you started answering the question, uh, or asking the question, rather. Um, so I am very specific. So if I feel like it is going to be a case um, where we're looking at more issues related to strength, I similarly try and make it a conversation. I say to the client, I'm asking them about their typical day. All right, you, you know, say you went to the store. Um, how many bags could you carry? How do you do your laundry? Um, how much laundry do you do? How far do you walk with it? Um, how far, where do you eat lunch? How do you get there? How long does it take you to get there? And then I quote the client extensively in the letter describing exactly the way it limits their ability to function. So, for example, I had a client this week who said that what they do all day is they walk around the city. And I got really nervous for a minute because I was thinking, oh, this is totally going to be a grid case. And he's like, yep, I walk around the city and I just stop for about five minutes every block. <laughs> I thought, all right, like that's a good example, you know. Um, and the more you can let the client speak to their own experiences like that and document that and then link that back to anything you may have in the medical evidence is really the key to our success there. Great. That's a good advice. Um, there's a specific question about uh, fibromyalgia. Um, so I don't know like, if you have any advice on fibromyalgia cases, because I don't think that's a, a specific listing. And maybe these cases are a fibromyalgia may be, um, you know, evaluated under a particular, uh, another listing. So how difficult do you find it to get an approval for a listing? Any suggestions? This case does have a diagnosis for osteoarthritis. Um, and this person also has a college education. So um, I know sometimes depression is associated with fibromyalgia because the individual um, is not able to work anymore. Um, you know, so can you talk a little bit about that specific diagnosis of fibromyalgia and any tips on documenting the limitations? Okay, um, I can take that question. Yeah. Um, no, there isn't a specific listing for fibromyalgia, but you are correct in that we are looking at the, the mental and physical um, impact of the, the diagnosis. Um, 
in order for us to, um, what, what we're looking at, because sometimes it's, it's actually difficult for doctors to diagnose you with fibromyalgia, so we're looking at those, um, the tender point, the number of tender points that, um, they do the tender point examination, I believe there's 14 tender points, I, I may be wrong, but there's tender points that the doctor will touch certain areas of the body, and if you have, um, they're counting the number of positive tender points that you report, um, before they actually confirm that diagnosis. So with us, usually there's, with the fibromyalgia, what I've seen is that there's usually some other conditions that are, um, or impairments that they're also um, reporting. And it's usually some type of spinal condition. Um, usually the depression comes with it. They may be talking about some neuropathy. So they may be looking at how to refer um, refer to other listings if there is additional impairments reported and um, supported by the documentation. If not, we're looking at functioning. We're looking at if, okay, you're reporting um, all over pain, what type of treatment are you receiving? Are you um, receiving continuing treatment? Are you being compliant with the medications? And how is it affecting your ability to function? So if we can't refer your condition to a listing, we're looking at um, your reported symptoms of pain and how it is impairing you to get through your day. Great. Thank you for that um, explanation. Um, here's a question, I think, how, do, how does SSA use the grid to determine whether someone in the age range between two and 13 years of age? So, um, that goes to say that um, the category for the grids is, I think it's 18 to 49 for younger um, individuals. So these are for adults. Um, they're not used for kids. I am I correct? <laughs> that? Yes. Okay. Okay. So don't look at the grids for kids. It starts at 18, right? 18 to 49 would be the first category. Um, and plus, for children's cases, uh, Social Security is not evaluating work uh, necessarily. That's a question. Um, this is a question, um, you know, some of our SOAR uh, trained case managers do hearing. So here's a question, how do I address age for the grids when applicant advances to a different age category from the time of application to time of hearing? So Meg, maybe you can talk to that when somebody moves to another um, age category. Does that change your theory of the case and, and how does that happen? What is that all about? So yeah, I think you need to have a strategic conversation with your client before the start of the hearing in that scenario. Um, so what you can do um, is you can amend the onset date to their birthday. Um, so what we often do here at HAP is we would go into the hearing arguing that the person is disabled at 49, but indicating either in a letter brief pre-hearing or even in a conversation with an administrative law judge that we are potentially open to amending the onset date to age 50 or 55, and that tends to work very well. In our experience, um, administrative law judges love the listings, and they would love to make a decision based on the listings. And so a lot of times if you tell your client, um, you know, this is what's going to happen if we amend the onset date, the judge Sometimes the judge will even say, if you amend the onset date, I'll make an allowance. Um, and then the claimant needs to know in advance that what they're giving up, they may be giving up back benefits. But for most of our clients, the idea of just having income moving forward is so compelling that they happily amend their onset date. Great. Um, Jennifer, do you want to add to that? Does that happen also at the DDS level? You, you said that uh, DDS applies the grids. If the age category changes from date of application, uh, maybe a, a few months later they're in a different age category. Um, is that the same thing where you could amend the onset date? Correct. To a later date. Okay. Correct. So we're going to. So if, if someone turned um, 55, which would place them into a higher age category, we essentially are making a statement regarding. Um, functioning prior to that higher age category, then if we find that they're disabled, then we're going to give them, um, you know, that disability date the, the day before their 55th birthday. Right. Um, that's helpful, too. Um, we have a couple questions on the DOT, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, and that ONET, O-N-E-T. 
um, as a resource. Um, and it, it's come up in a couple different ways, but again, this one is geared toward somebody doing hearing. So what if our local ALJs do not accept ONET as an authoritative resource and still use the DOT to describe job descriptions and thus do not account for changes in the vocation at the present time? Um, is that a question, Meg, you can talk about? Um, about ONET versus the Dictionary of Occupational Titles? So we use the DOT because in our right. experience that's what judges use. Okay. And the DOT is available online, is that right? Yes. Okay. Right? Great. And ONET is obviously online too. What are the differences? Do you want to explain a little bit about that? Um, Maybe Meg, like how do you use ONET um, maybe to an assess a, a case to get information about the task performed at a job or the DOT if you're using that to actually cite in your briefs or your letters? Yeah, so I don't have experience with ONET because we use just, usually do just use the DOT, um, but oftentimes we are looking at um, comparing what the DOT says to how the job was actually performed, which is really relevant. So sometimes people are saying their job title is one thing, and you look it up in the DOT, and it's not matching how they say they actually performed their job. And that is relevant to the evaluation of whether or not they can go back to that past work. Um, so that is often how we are utilizing it. And then we also utilize it in terms of the information it provides about like the level of education people might need to have that job. Um, so reading levels and things like that, those are the two ways we primarily use it. Okay. You, said, do you have any thoughts, or I'm sorry, Denise, rather, do you have any thoughts on that, the ONET? Um, so I know you cited that in your slide, um, ONET and the DOT. We'll, we'll, we'll get, we have a bunch of questions on that resource, so we'll, we'll provide some additional guidance on that as well. Um, so it, look, we still have some questions that we're really not able to get because we are running out of time, uh, but we'll be sure to forward these to the presenters, uh, maybe reach out to you, uh, you know, so, you know, for more information, uh, maybe flesh it out a little bit. Um, but the questions are great. Um, we have a lot of very detailed questions that we'll be sure to, again, get back to you. So I just wanted to, again, take this time to thank our uh, presenters um, and really to tell you as a SOAR community to um, take some of those next steps to familiarize yourself with the listings and the grids, um, you know, really document medical records and functional limitations in um, the medical summary report, uh, be specific as possible, um, and really utilize the SOAR TA Center and your local leads uh, with any questions you have. And again, follow up with your DDS examiners uh, for additional information. Again, they may be able to give you some of that information about RFCs and uh, ordering a CE or not to order a CE and, and to really help you, um, you know, with the additional information that they may need. Maybe the work history portion isn't flushed out enough. Maybe you then can use some of these tips on utilizing the DOT to provide more information on, on the job the individual um, did so that maybe there could be an allowance at that step five. Um, so really utilize your DDS uh, examiners too. Um, so we want to make sure that you um, complete the webinar evaluation. So similar to uh, other webinars, you're immediately redirected when you sign out, but you, um, this is a new um, disclaimer uh, by uh, Cisco, by WebEx, um, that you're going to a site that's not theirs. Um, you're still going to the trusted site to do the um, evaluation. So we really want you to do that because, again, your, um, you know, evaluation really informs future um, webinars and what we do. So be sure to, you know, um, you know, click continue when you get out of this site. 
And again, a big thanks to our presenters who put a lot of work into their slides and you for um, giving up uh, some of your day uh, to learn more about this critical uh, part of the Social Security determination process. So thank you and we look forward to seeing you uh, March 25th, uh, our next webinar on the topic of SOAR and integrating uh, with criminal justice system. So again, thank you, have, an, have a great rest of your day, bye-bye. <laughs>